everyone and welcome to our session about insights into unsecured Kubernetes in the wild. We are really excited to be here virtually and hope you'll enjoy and learn from this talk. All right, so let's go over the agenda for today. Uh, first, we'll talk about attacks against misconfigured Docker. We'll talk about the notorious misconfiguration in Docker that allow uh, executing uh, commands on Docker demons. And then we will talk about the trends, the growing trends, trends of attacking those demons. Uh, and after that, we'll go over the research we did, which is split into two parts. The first one is that we thought how Kubernetes can be misconfigured. And then we actively scan, scan the internet for such misconfigured Kubernetes clusters, and the results are going to shock you. At least they shocked me. After that, we'll go uh, and talk about the honeypot we deployed. So we deployed those honeypots in order to see how frequent and what are the, the impact of those attacks on, in, on uh, misconfigured Kubernetes components. So basically, those honeypots are the misconfigured Kubernetes components. Uh, then we'll show you the results of the the honeypots, and then we'll talk about Hildegard, which is a crypto jacking malware we found using one of our honeypots. It's the first ever documented malware that is designed to attack kubelets, and we'll show you how it takes over all of the cluster. And right after it, we'll talk about how to avoid such misconfigurations so that stuff like this won't happen to you. All right, so let's go over who we are. So Umi and Jay both are security researchers at Palo Alto Networks under Unit 42, which is the division for uh, threat intelligence in Palo Alto Networks. Uh, our area of expertise is the cloud. We're both really enthusiastic about the cloud and all of our researchers were about uh, anything that involves the cloud that includes vulnerabilities, malware, uh, campaign, attack surfaces, and everything that is security-wise interesting. And as you see by the pictures, uh, we are both proud pet owners. I got my dog and Jay got his cats. Hopefully someday we'll be friends. So let's start and talk about insecure Docker demons. So basically, uh, Docker daemon listen on a Unix socket for API request and only root can acquire this uh, Unix socket. So Docker count on that, and that's why they don't have any authentication or authorization mechanism inside. So anything, anyone that acquired this socket can just run any commands on the Docker daemon. But there are also another option to configure Docker to listen on a TCP port. But as I said earlier, by default, there isn't any authentication or authorization. So that leads to the situation where people just expose their Docker daemon using the TCP socket, and they don't have any authentication or authorization, and anyone can just access their daemon and uh, execute commands. They can create new containers, delete existing containers, pull images, uh, execute commands on existing containers. They just got full privileges. And actually, last year we found that there were over 1,400 exposed unsecured Docker demons online. And my hunch is that during the last year, this number just got increased. Right? So we have this misconfiguration, but is this really a problem? Does anyone really exploit those demons? So we wanted to test it. And in 2019, Unit 42 researchers detected a malware that exploits exploit this misconfiguration. And they call it Graboid. And it was a worm, a crypto jacking worm. Uh, its purpose was to mine Monero, which is a cryptocurrency. And it propagated through uh, the misconfiguration of Docker and just exploited it and scan other Docker demons and exploited them as well. So we saw that, and this was 
two years ago, and it was just the tip of the iceberg. Because since then, we saw numerous other malware designed to attack unsecured Docker demons. And we actually have a honeypot that's been operating for more than uh, one year and a half. And we could see that during this time, the frequency of attacks was more than doubled and the number of adversaries was more than tripled. Uh, we talked about it on this black hat and the findings, the findings over there are just nuts. So we have this problem with Docker and everyone exploit it, but we wanted to, to ask ourselves, is there any similar issue like this in Kubernetes as well? Are there any common misconfiguration in Kubernetes that can allow such attacks? And if there are, are there any attack surfaces uh, for that misconfigurations? And if there are any attack surfaces, are they being exploited in the wild? So that's the question that led us in this research. And now I'm going to hand it to Jay. Thank you, Avi. Let's dive into Kubernetes. So we have seen a lot of attacks against misconfigured uh, Docker demons. And we thought that, hey, this may also happen to Docker's big, bigger brother, Kubernetes. So we want to look into the attacks against uh, Kubernetes in the wild. And what are the components, what are the attack surface of Kubernetes that we are uh, focusing on? So we picked two uh, components in Kubernetes, API server and Kubelet. The reason we picked these two components is that they mirror the functionalities of Docker daemons in Docker environment. API server is like a gateway to the entire to to an entire uh, Kubernetes cluster, and Kubelet is like a gateway to uh, to a single worker node. So the API server can control. So API server takes the HTTP request and translate into operation to control nodes part and deployment in a, in a Kubernetes cluster. Kubelet takes, usually takes HTTP requests from API server and translate, translate those HTTP requests into operations uh, in a single worker node. So let's see how these two components can be, uh, can, can be misconfigured. API server misconfiguration. So by default, Kubernetes API server listens on two ports a secure port and a local host port. Secure port use mutual TOS to authenticate between clients and servers. By default, it runs on, on port 6443. So any clients who need to communicate with the API server need to uh, pass strict mutual authentication in order to uh, invoke any API on the API server. And for the local host port, it is by default, it is intended for testing and bootstrap purpose. By default, it is exposed to only local host uh, on port ADAP. It is not supposed to be exposed to the entire internet. It is, it can only listen to requests coming from the same host of the API server. And unauthenticated an clients accessing this particular local host port are mapped to system master groups, meaning that any request sent to this port doesn't need to be authenticated. Any anonymous request sent to this port can actually act as a system, uh, system admin of the uh, Kubernetes cluster. So what can possibly go wrong with this local host port? What if the ho local host port is exposed to the public internet? So on the right, there's the, the there's this is how a uh, Kubi uh, API server can be misconfigured. If someone accidentally binds this port to 0.0.0.0, .0, instead of uh, local host, this uh, port is exposed to, in the, to the entire internet. And anyone who knows the address of the IP address of this uh, API server will be able to control the entire cluster. So this is one of the most common misconfiguration that, that we have seen in the past year. And another commonly seen 
misconfiguration in API server is overly permissive role-based access control. So by default, Kubernetes come with a set of default rule, default uh, cluster rules, and default role binding. For example, uh, by default, what I highlight in the orange box here, then an authenticated user or an anonymous request sent to the API server is mapped to an authenticate uh, an authenticate group. And this group is is, bind, is is this this group is bound with the public info viewer. So the system public info viewer role doesn't have much permission. It can only view a list of APIs available uh, in this API server or in this Kubernetes. Whatever uh, Kubernetes is complex, each cluster can be shared between tens or hundreds of developers. When more and more developers work in, in the same cluster, what if someone accidentally binds this system and authenticate group to another more privileged role, such as cluster admin or admin? And this can be also, this, this again can be really bad. Any uh, attackers or cyber criminals who knows the IP address of this API server will be able to gain privilege control to the cluster. Now let's look at, let, let's look at the second component that we focus on, Kubelet. Kubelet works similar to API server, but it can control a sing, only a single worker node. It can control only the containers and parts uh, in that worker node. By default, unauthenticated requests sent to Kubelet are mapped to system anonymous user and or system, uh, this user is mapped to the unauthentic group, unauthenticate group. So this user and group doesn't have too much, doesn't have a lot of permission in the cluster it, itself. However, by default, Kubelet uh, accept anonymous request. So anyone can, anyone who can communicate with Kubelet can send requests to it. And this is a problem. By default, this Kubelet allow anonymous access. What if someone accidentally exposed this Kubelet port to the entire internet? This is again, a very common misconfiguration we have seen. Although the misconfigured Kubelet is not as bad as misconfigured API server. However, a misconfigured Kubelet allow an attacker to gain control to a single worker node. And from this single worker node, they gain the initial access and can start to uh, move, lateral, move laterally to other worker nodes uh, in the cluster, as we will see in the Hildegard malware that we, we found. Now let's look at how we can, how we find uh, real world attacks against Kubernetes. We need to find, we, we, at, the at the time we started the research, we have the hypothesis that Kubernetes will be attacked in the same way as attacker uh, attack Docker Demon, but we didn't have any proof. We didn't have any data. So we have to find our data or create our data. So we lay out two different research methods. We proactively, uh, a proactive method and a reactive method. For the proactive, uh, proactive method, we periodically scan the entire internet for misconfigured Kubernetes. And for the reactive method, uh, as Abby will talk about in a few in, in a few minutes, we deploy a few uh, intentionally misconfigured Kubernetes honeypot to attract attackers and to learn what are the what, what are the technique techniques and procedures of uh, of these attacks. So one advantage of having these two methods deployed at the same time is that they can actually cross verify with each other. Our, our, our Kubernetes scanner should be able to find our misconfigured Kubernetes uh, honeypot. And on our Kubernetes honeypot, it should be able to pick up the scanning traffic from our scanner. So this is how we actually make sure these two uh, different methods all work uh, as, they, uh, as we expected. For the proactive research, as much as we would like to scan the entire IPv4 space by ourselves. It is not that it is not that easy. Actually, uh, as soon as I start to scan the internet, 
either my ISP or the cloud provider or my cloud uh, service provider send me a warning. They typically don't like any of, they don't like their customer to scan the internet. This is the scanning traffic is usually considered malicious. So I went for an easier, easier path. Instead of scanning the internet by myself, I used the internet IoT scanner, such as Census and Shodan to help me at least identify the potential misconfigured endpoints. So I use I, I use these two services from Census and Shodan to uh, to collect I collect data from them every week and do some data ag aggregation and filtering to come up with the list of potential uh, Kubernetes node or potential port that run could be uh, API server or could be Then I do the I I then I start to query those nodes to see if they are uh, misconfigured. And after that, I did some post analysis. The result is what I'm going to show in the next few slides. Overall, uh, in the period of three months, we identified more than 2,000 unsecured Kubernetes cluster that consists of more than 5,000 nodes. And we think these 5,000 nodes, there are more than 31,000 CPUs that attackers can, poten can potentially uh, mis uh, abuse. And we think these 5,000 nodes, there are more than 75,000 active bots running. And one of the biggest clusters that I encountered during the research had more than 5, 000, uh, 500 nodes. And more than and more than two thousand active parts. And that said, that's a that's that's a very shocking finding and, and also sad because I, if an attacker, uh, found this cluster, they can not only steal, uh, data from uh, from that Kubernetes cluster, they can also start to deploy a lot of malicious payload in those in, in, in this particular cluster. So the cluster that we, so there's no way that I could individually identify the owner of each misconfigured Kubernetes cluster, but for a few that I could pick into, I can see that because they belong to e-commerce, finance, or even healthcare providers. And the figure here showed the overall uh, findings throughout the research. We, in, we overall uh, came across more than 37,000 containers and 40, 47 different image. And in this cluster, they expose more than 83,000 secrets that can be used to access application or parts or, or even the host. And each cluster exposed uh, each misconfigured Kubernetes cluster exposed different set of API server, uh, API, uh, different set of APIs. So because due to the misconfigured role-based access control, uh, uh, every misconfigured cluster can be misconfigured differently. For example, among all the misconfigured Kubernetes cluster that we, we encounter, 18% of them expose uh, the, the path API, they can list all the paths and read all the paths in those clusters. And only 13% uh, only 13 of the cluster expose the uh, secret API. And overall, ch uh, China and United States, uh, these two countries add up to more about 75% of the misconfigured Kubernetes cluster. This is kind of expected. Uh, these two countries are where most of the network infrastructure or cloud infrastructures are hosted. And these are some common, uh, these are some malicious activities that we have seen in those misconfigured Kubernetes. Most of the malicious activities started from deploying an official and signed Docker image such as Ubuntu, SendOS, or Debian. When attacker 
deploy this type of official and signed image, they are generally trusted by, by the uh, uh, Kubernetes platform. However, after deploying this image, the attacker then deploy the malicious payload inside this container. Most of this payload that we have seen involved in crypto jacking operations. Some of the payload may also attempt to uh, infect other nodes in the cluster, such as Hildegard that Evit will explain in, in a few slides. Now I will pass to Evit to talk about the reactive research, what we found in our honeypot. Right, thanks Jay, I'll take it from here. So let's talk about the reactive research. So basically the, the reason we did this reactive research is to see what is the frequency of those attacks and to see if there are any other attacks. And if there are, then what are the impacts? So we deployed two types of honeypots for around uh, six months. And the first one is misconfigured API server, where the RBAC is misconfigured in a way that any user that will access the API server will have uh, admin privileges. So that's really uh, critical. And the second honeypot is misconfigured kubelet. Uh, on this, in this honeypot, we just deploy kubelet with anonymous access allowed and expose it to the internet so that anyone that will access this kubelet will have permission to do anything he wants on that specific node. All right, so let's go over to the results. Uh, for the API server, it was really kind of disappointing because we saw zero uh, exploit attempts. But one interesting thing that we saw is that Sensys uh, scanned us really in depth. And when I say in depth, I mean that they query the API server for nodes, for pods, for uh, for a role, uh, for Rablock, for a secret, for anything that the API server had to offer. And for those of you who doesn't know what Tensys is, so that's a search engine. They just scan the whole internet, put it in a database, and allow users to query this database. So our honeypot for sure is being in census, but other than that, nothing interesting happened over there. And so let's go to the second part, to the Kubelet honeypot, which was really excited, really exciting. Uh, we got exploited numerous times by different adversaries. Uh, most of the attacks were for crypto jacking purposes. And one of the attacks included a really interesting malware. They did a lot of, of mess, so we decided to explore it. And then we uh, found out about Hildegard. So that's the name of the malware. Uh, we decided to call it Hildegard uh, as, there were, as there was a string in the, in the binary, uh, which was Hildegard. And this malware is just crazy. It's the first ever malware that is uh, designed to attack kubelets and to propagate across the cluster. And we'll talk about how it operates. So first of all, the first thing that happens is that the attacker exploits an unsecure kubelet. And after that, it deploys a container uh, that includes first a uh, teammate client, which is an open, which is a tool that can be uh, used as a reverse shell, and this way the attacker can run commands on the on the node. And the second thing they do is they deploy a uh, mascan, which is a scan tools, and this tool is scan, this tool scans the uh, internal network of the cluster and try to find other kubelets, and when it does, it exploits them as well. So Hildegard just tried to propagate to all of the nodes in the cluster, and on every node, it deployed first a, a crypto miner, which uh, mined Monero, and a IRC client uh, that will connect to an IRC server owned by the attackers, and this way, the attackers could send 
uh, commands to the containers and do whatever they want on the cluster. So that's uh, how, how everything works basically, uh, but we wanted to talk a little bit about the techniques they use because we think it's really worth talking about. So let's go over and talk about true escalation and Hildegard deploy two open source tools. Uh, the first one is Pirates. So this tool scan for cloud credentials and cloud and in the cloud metadata server, whether if it's AWS, GCP, or Azure. And it also looks for uh, service account tokens or secrets. And when it found, when it finds one of them, they it just try to escalate. Uh, to get higher privileges. Second tool is pot B. I hope I pronounce it uh, good. Uh, well, it's break out the box, and as the name implies, it will try to break out of containers. It will try to use known vulnerabilities. Uh, it will try to find if there are any uh, capability or syscall that are, uh, are in there by mistake and try to exploit them. They'll try to access Docker daemon on the host, as we talked about in the uh, first slides of the presentation. They also try to find some cloud and Kubernetes credentials and even look at the environment variables for uh, credentials. And other than that, Hildegard by itself has a script that tries also to find uh, credentials. And it will scan uh, the cloud provider metadata server. They scan for SSH keys. They scan for Docker credentials. And of course, and foremost, they scan for Kubernetes service accounts token. So you can see the script uh, below. That's how it does so. All right, and to my favorite part, which is defense evasion. Well, Hildegard uses two types of techniques of defense evasion. The first one is they use LD preload, and we won't get into what is LD preload because that can take like uh, 30 minutes, but we'll just say that Hildegard just hijacks some libc functions and while hijacking them, it replaced them with other functions uh, that basically does the same as the normal functions, except the fact that they uh, sanitize the output. And by that, I mean that this how Hildegard hide itself. So let's say, for example, we run PS. So we won't see P we won't see Hildegard in the PS, and if they run LS, we won't see the Hildegard in the LS. And if we want run top to see the CPU usage, we won't see the uh, the CPU usage because Hildegard because the the LD preload function will show us something else. And the second part is the encrypted ELF binary, and Hildegard uses a well-known IRC client in order for for him not to get detected, they encrypt it and decrypt it only when running into the memory. So in this way, static analysis tools cannot uh, be effective. All right, that's all for Hildegard for today. Uh, Jay, can you take it from here? Thank you, Aviv. Now let's look at how individual can protect and defend against these uh, cyber criminals. This threat exploit is configuration. 99% of the known attacks exploit is configuration. Like we only look at the API server, the misconfigured API server, and misconfigured Kubelet. But as uh, Evi mentioned earlier, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, to our biggest surprise is that we didn't see any uh, attacks uh, targeting our uh, API server honeypot. We think that attackers haven't really moved from uh, attacking uh, Docker demons to Kubernetes. Kubernetes is much more complicated than Docker. And however, the potential computational and storage resource as well as data in the Kubernetes 
should be uh, can be much bigger and more juicier than this configure uh, Docker daemon. So we think this can be just the beginning, and there we expect to see more and more attacks against Kubernetes in the near future. What are the best? What are the uh, strategy to protect your Kubernetes, Kubernetes infrastructure? Best practice, follow the best practice should be to keep you secure, uh, really secure. The layers of defense built into the Kubernetes platform provide very strong security, such as uh, uh, namespace, namespace isolation, network policy, and second, secure your network and identity. As long as you make sure you don't accidentally expose your Kubernetes components such as API server, Kubelet, proxy, etcd, you should be uh, safe from 99% of these attacks. And also secure your identity, make sure you follow the principle of least privilege, minimize the number of users in your users and groups in your Kubernetes and continuously monitors the permission provision to these uh, users and, and, and applications. Finally, patch frequently. Patch not only your application, but patch also your uh, Kubernetes. Well, Kubernetes is complicated, involving a lot of moving parts. And when you have a cluster of hundreds of worker nodes, it's not easy for a single person to oversee them. It's, you can never be 100% sure that you don't have any uh, insecure or accidentally introduce any misconfiguration. So if you are not so comfortable to uh, provision and maintain a Kubernetes clusters from scratch, use a managed Kubernetes service such as AWS, e AWS EKS or Azure AKS. Cloud service providers can help you manage and control the, the uh, control plane, and you only need to manage the application running on top of the Kubernetes clusters. And also most of the cloud service provider have some sort of guardrail to oversee uh, your Kubernetes cluster to make sure that you don't have any misconfiguration. The next one, ephemeral workload design. So if you have an ephemeral workload design, meaning that your all the parts and containers in your cluster can can like, uh, are stateless. They can be killed and restart anytime without losing uh, losing anything. So if your container infrastructure or microservice applications are designed this way, then attackers don't really have any way to gain uh, get the initial or gain any gain the foothold inside your application. As long as you see a containers uh, drift from the uh, from the normal from the normal or benign state, you can simply just kill and restart the container, and you start from a, 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 a fresh and, and clean state again. And finally, con continuous monitoring is also important. Use tools to check configurations of your cluster, and use tools to check for sus suspicious workloads or traffic. Again. Although your infrastructure is secure, your application may be vulnerable. Your uh, zero day or new vulnerability may be found in the application deployed in your clusters. And if attacker can, can attack those applications, there may be a chance that they, they can escape, break out the container and, and start to attack your uh, Kubernetes. So continuous monitoring to, uh, to a Kubernetes cluster is important. And this is the end of our presentation. Thank you for being in our session. If you have any questions, feel free to reach uh, me, Jaken at pelatonetwork.com or Aviv. Uh, this is a, a, a session, is his email at Pelato Network. And we also publish the findings in Unit 42 box. Feel free to go to the unit 42.pelatonetwork.com to see uh, more of our research.